Let's go, Rider Nation. I'm ready. I'm ready. Yeah, here we go, here we go. It's a feeling now. Hit them high, hit them low. Cause we're dealing now. Everybody's giving it all they got. Cause we're ready. Welcome to the Piffles Podcast, the podcast where we make fun of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers for losing gray cups. One of my favorite things. This is your Saskatchewan Rough Riders fan podcast. You got me as always. I'm Alex. I'm Steve. And I've been thinking when the Bills uh -oh. lost, lost all of their Super Bowls, the acronym became Boy I Love Losing Super Bowls. Like Bombers is too long, so blue I think is our sweet spot. Like Bombers lose ultimately every time. Uh um, I like that. <laughs> uh, Balt uh, bombers lose ultimately at the end. I don't know. I've been I've been like working on things here. I don't know. So listeners, hit me up. I, I need an acronym for blue. Hey, and they the do hold bombers. the record for most Grey Cup losses now. Actually, yeah. after last year, but and the best uh, acronyms that you can get for blue, Greg, we'll take, we'll make signs and take them to the Banjo Bowl next year. <laughs> Hell, I'll make a shirt. Someone in our group is probably going to get hit, and it's probably going to be me. <laughs> but it's I don't worth know. I got it a lot because... of I got a lot of friends around the rum hut, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> Are you sure? Mm. He's been pretty quiet lately for some reason. I don't know why. It's it's been very quiet on Blue Bomber social media. Um, it's been kind of nice actually. Um, thanks for listening wherever you get your podcasts, watching on YouTube, watching on Sastel Max TV on demand. We appreciate it. Um, Piffles Podcast. You can give us a follow on X at Piffles Pod. I'm at Real Alex D. You can find me at Safamod. And as always, I do not need nor want your pity follows at Greg on Sports. And we're also doing that blue sky thing because people are going over there. So we're there as well. Just search up Piffles Pod. And of course, uh, check us out on Facebook as well. And the website, pifflespodcast.com. Just because the season's over doesn't mean the talk about the riders is over. So there'll be plenty of stuff going up in the off season on the website there and Piffles podcast of course is brought to you by our great friends at Dairy Queen on Elphinstone Street and Sass Drive in Regina. All right. Let's get into it. Let's talk about the Blue Bombers losing the Grey Cup. Time for the opening kickoff. <laughs> And I just want to start out by saying, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, the funny thing, the funny thing about <clears throat> sports fandom is, and I'm, I'm guilty of this. I think I take way more pleasure in watching another team lose like the bombers than watching my own team win. And it's funny because I've learned as a Ryder fan to accept that my team's not going to win all the time. They've won four times in a hundred and, 13, 14 years, whatever it is. So we have to resort to things like this, but we're going to have fun doing it. And that just means we're experienced at it. Exactly. So well, and the, the way I look at it is this was the third best option that would have happened this year. Um, first would have been the Riders win. Uh, second would have been considering the two teams in your stadium fire. And the third way is the Bombers losing. So I, 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 I'm i okay with this. It's not even the Argos winning. It's the Bombers losing. And I think a lot of people are uh, missing that fact that I was not cheering an Argos win. I was definitely cheering a Bombers lose. If they both could have lost, I would have been happy. But that just wasn't going to happen. Well, and the funny thing about that game, and it was the final score was 41 24. So it didn't look particularly close. It was 17 16 Toronto with what seven minutes left in the fourth quarter. So it was and there. And then what happened? Well, and then a, a really interesting coaching decision after the touchdown um, by Toronto. I think that was the one by uh, Dijon Brissette where the Bombers only had 11 players on the field. So they were using yeah, Zach's we fingers to count. Oh, yeah. Um, so we might I'm have surprised. extra players on the field. They didn't have enough. I'm surprised at how little talk there was because Patrick Forsythe was mentioning in a group on WhatsApp. He's like, did anybody else see this? And I went back and looked and saw 11 men. I'm like, yep, you're correct. And there was nothing, not a single word on social media until two days later. 
that's usually something you hear pretty quick about. It's kind of odd that it was. Apparently, ignored. if you go back to the video, one of the bombers guys was counting as the ball was being snapped. <laughs> like the fact that it got missed by the entire coaching staff of Winnipeg to not call a timeout, or were they out of timeouts at that point? I can't remember. But no, nope, they should have. They would have still had at least one left. They had yeah. for sure one. Yeah. So, like, the fact that that got missed, like, I know everyone's blaming Zach, and Zach had a bad game, but that was probably one of the worst games I've seen coached by O'Shea since his first season. And and not even just O'Shea himself, but that was a very, unlike the Bombers' style performance, they were making mental errors, they were committing the misconduct penalty after the timeout when, uh, who was it that smacked the ball out of the center's hand? Like they were doing the things that you haven't seen a lot of during their successful run. Even in their Grey Cup losses, they weren't they weren't committing those kind of mental errors that we saw this Sunday against Toronto. Um, so it goes to that two point convert or not going for a two point convert. We saw um, Corey Mace do that in the West semifinal against BC. Um, so I was it was. Interesting to me that Toronto wouldn't go for two there to go up by nine instead of going up by eight. Ultimately, it didn't matter. Um, but the whole game changed on not just that touchdown, but then Zach Caleros getting hurt. Uh, so it was his finger, which apparently he could like see through his finger. That's how deep this cut was. Um, they put him back in, and then, of course proceeds to throw interception after interception after interception, bad throws, bad reads, bad play calling, everything just went against them, which is good. But um, what did you guys think of the final seven minutes and what the Bombers did when it was still, I mean, the game was there. The funny part is Zach's numbers actually got better. Um, in in that last little stretch because they were actually catching the balls at that point going into are you, that. Are you saying they, as in the Argos were catching the balls at that point? Oh, well, they, they were through. actually. Yeah. Like, Hey, at least Zach finally threw a touchdown in a great cop in the last three years. <laughs> it was the wrong team. Almost threw a couple. It was through the wrong team. But he, it was a touchdown. Hey, and but props to him through he, that. Props to him through that finger injury. Sorry to, uh, to throw a great cup record, 164 yards in interception. Uh, return yards. So, so you're saying that. he finally showed up on the stat line in a great cup. So good for him. <laughs> yeah. But like go- going into that garbage time, like that's what it was. He only had nine completions. He ended with 15. Like it, it wasn't a good performance before he got hurt. And like, like I said on, um, on X that I listened to bombing and Zach talk, go through their feelings on it because I was kind of curious on how they were processing it and bless Darren bombing, but he was basically trying to say, well, Zach's fingers was there. like that happened like late in the third quarter or was that beginning of the fourth? Like it was late in the no, game. End, like, end he, of was the a, he was having a terrible game before that. And as bad as he's been playing, I honestly think you need to credit the Argos with a great defensive scheme on that one. Dembski didn't have a catch until the final like six minutes in the game. Like McManus should have been the MVP of that game. He was three like, yards away from getting the MVP. If he scores that touchdown, there's no question he wins it. Yeah. Like our buckle had a good game, but McManus was the most valuable player in that game by far. Our buckle got it because the, the bias ranking goes quarterback Canadian player and somewhere down below is defensive player. You, you have to show up like James Johnson in the, uh, uh, 07 Grey Cup too. He yeah, won that one by much. default. No one else did anything. <laughs> <laughs> you you have to have to have those stats to even be considered at this point. If if McManus didn't win it on Sunday, we're not going to see it anytime soon. They sh- they that- should honestly create a most outstanding defensive player for the Grey Cup. You have the Canadian player. You have the most outstanding player. Why not throw a defensive player in there too? Too, too long of ceremonies, which actually yeah. I want to bring that up too. Um, the, uh, the great cup being handed to the what, president or MLSE 
not going to the players. Yeah, that was one the thing owner, that the ownership this, group. Yeah, that's so weird. Yeah, handed Randy Ambrosi Brosi handed it off to the ownership group, which the CFL is great for giving it to the players first. Generally speaking, um, the NHL does that with the Stanley Cup, giving it to the to the captain of the winning team as well. And it's always nice because you look at baseball, you look at the Super Bowl, it's given out to the owners. And it's like, that's so boring. Like, congratulations on writing a few checks. Like, give it to the guys who actually won the game. So it's a little disappointing to see that happen in, in this great cup. I, but... I'm hoping I'm hoping that's a one and done because that just seemed like the minute I'm like, I don't recall that ever happening before. Like, I, and I, I'm trying, like, I'm going no. back in the database of my brain trying to figure out, I'm like, I don't think that's ever happened before. Although they could do that next year in Winnipeg for Grey Cup. Um, give it to, well, who are the rider owners? Um, us. Um, so <laughs> uh, could, uh... can you imagine if they gave it to Craig Reynolds? I, I think like oh, half of the fan base would minds. puke in their mouths. <laughs> oh. um, but that fourth quarter of the Grey Cup, the collapse by Winnipeg, how it happened and just giving it away the way that they did was just so satisfying. There were so many fist pumps. There might have been a couple uh degeneration X chops um in in a my couple. household. Uh, there, there was definitely a lot in our in our chat. I know that a few, <laughs> a few dozen or so um each time. Um every time there was a turnover and then a Toronto touchdown, it was just it was great. It really was. It was so so good. And this puts the end or does it to the dynasty talk. Easy milt. Easy milt. We got to bring him on to talk about that. Well, maybe not about that, but. If I, I hear the word I... dynasty out of one more Bombers fan, it to the guy who said three in 10 years was enough, I hope you get nut punched by a toddler sometime in the next few days. Just a <laughs> no. That's, that's a reach even for them, but. There, like you said, there's moving the goalposts and then there's, you know, launching it out of the stadium. Three and six is not a dynasty. Losing three consecutive Grey Cups, or the three feet as I called it, is not oh, no. a dynasty. That is it. It is over. You are now six years removed from your first Grey Cup win in that collective. It's done. You, you want a dynasty? You start fresh next year. Here's the problem is they, they aren't because that team ain't getting younger and it looks like the, the players that barely showed up this year want to get more money. Well, they're going to run it back with a lot of that same team because they're at home and they, they have to still. Yeah. And they still believe that's the, the group that can get it done. Who has failed three times in the big game in a row. Now props to Winnipeg for getting to the great cup five straight times. That's impressive. I would love for the riders to get there five straight times. Don't get me wrong. That's, Congratulations. You got to win them. Nobody calls the Buffalo Bills of the 90s a dynasty for losing four straight Super Bowls. It's just things I learned is that like the riders of the 60s and 70s are basically a dynasty just because they got to a bunch of great cups and lost. So I learned that this this past weekend and I saw somebody saying that the Stampeders of the 2000s were a dynasty? No, not even close. Montreal? No, they won a few, sure. But they Wasn't... they made six or seven great cups in ten years, Alex. And they lost like five of them. But but they made it. Isn't that enough? Well, and and I also learned that the Riders of 07 to thirteen was a dynasty. Which, in in all Especially honesty, if you discount that year that didn't happen. Yeah, compared to rider history, that is our dynasty right there. We call it, I mean, we go back and we, we look at it and we call it like the golden era of the riders um, in terms of, you know, championships and whatnot. And it, and it was. But nobody has ever once, ever talked about a dynasty in that. So the dynasty is over. It's dead. I don't care what Milt Stiegel says. Congratulations on getting there five times. You lost. What would he know about winning Grey Cups anyways? Right, exactly. Well, like I said, if with, with a guy with no rings, getting there is the accomplishment. 
But see, this is why he can't come to the show because I'm going to make no rings jokes constantly. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, well, let's get away from the game here. We'll talk about a little bit more of the Grey Cup stuff uh, that happened because I was there. I wasn't there for the game, uh, but I was there for the festivities and everything. Um, the Jonas Brothers halftime show. What did you guys think of the Jonas Brothers? I, I missed it because I was taking my daughter to cheer. So I thought it was solid. It wasn't aimed at, at our generation by any stretch. We're not the, the band base that they're trying to reach with that one, but I think for what they wanted, they they did solid. Also, I learned, I had no idea that uh, one of the Jonas Brothers uh, was in DNCE, whatever they call themselves, the Cake by the Ocean band. Yeah. I had no idea. I was When I was listening, I'm like, why the hell are they playing this song? Don't they have enough of their own? That's and Joe Jonas, Jonas, I believe, right? Joe? I think so, yeah. Yeah. I had no idea. I like how each of the Jonas's had their own little, you know, solo portion, and Kevin's just off in the background going... Yeah, I'll just wait to the next Jonas Brothers song, I guess. <laughs> it was good. I, thought it was a, I enjoyed it. I thought, I thought it was a fine enough show. Um, I've My only complaint about it is it seemed like they were very low energy for songs that could have been a little bit higher energy. So if they would have played it up a little bit more, I think it would have just taken it to the next level for me. Um, but again, not. I, I, I know those songs. I know of those songs. I've heard them before, but they're not trying to get me to watch the game. I'm already, wa- I'm already going to watch the game. So, um, from all accounts, it it was it was a good stage show. Everything looked good from the videos I saw from people at the game, and generally, people like it. So, I mean, that's that's a win right there for for the league when you can get a big name get like that, and have everybody generally say that was a good show then they did they did something right so congratulations to the league for for getting that i i I still wish people would understand that the halftime act is probably not for you so we it's for your television audience it's not for the people that are there it's not for the people that are gonna watch the game people fans of the cfl are gonna watch the great cup regardless it's for those who aren't planning on watching the game So, um, before we get into Greg's rant, and I hope you have some notes on that, Greg, because I know you have a lot to say coming up about player awards. Um, I, I got I just, to admit, though, I'm not, I'm not I, I've calmed down since what Thursday, Friday, whatever day it was. I've I calmed down. I a lot told you, me. you should have, you guys, you guys should have started a show Thursday night after it happened and called me, <laughs> and, and we could have done it from wherever I was, Spirit of Edmonton that night. Um, and we, we could have done it there. Um, but I just wanted to give a quick little recap of uh, the team parties, how BC hosted um, the outside festival was great. The inside stuff at the convention centers was excellent. Um, overall, it was like a pretty well put together, great cup event, but the team party rooms were disappointing to me. And I think it was because of a lack of people there. I don't know if that was just because the lack of, locals there just because the BC Lions weren't in the game. So people kind of tuned out a little bit, but it was very low key in, in the biggest rooms. So in the convention center, um, obviously bomber house was, was filled all the time because well, Winnipeg was in it. Right. Um, but Ryderville, BC Lions, den spirit of Edmonton, the three biggest rooms, the few times I went down to BC Lions, den and Ryderville dead absolutely dead i'm talking like 60 people tops tops in those rooms um spirit of edmonton ended up becoming the the best one out of them all and it was nice because they were actually in the convention center with all the other team parties which normally isn't the case for for spirit of edmonton but now that they're you know being propped up by the elks and included by the league now um they were there with them but overall i was kind of just disappointing in that sense. Great people, obviously, um, that go to Grey Cup, see the CFL family from across the country, and it was wonderful. But it just felt lacking something. Like, there was no buzz in the city. And I think that's what attributed to that um, in the team parties. I, I think, unfortunately, with a market like 
Vancouver and your Toronto's where, and it's not for lack of trying on um, uh, Doman's part. He's really trying to get that buzz back, but they got so much stuff going on all the time. Like ne- I think next year in Winnipeg, it's probably going to be a, big, a lot bigger buzz. Even hopefully the bombers aren't in it, but I, I think you're going to get that there. You're going to get that here. It's just something different when the entire uh, market is behind it. Um, but that being said, everything I've seen looks like BC did a one hell of a job um, with everything they did. So when you have an owner that is that forward looking, I think they're going to be in a good spot here in the next couple of years. The one thing I really like that I saw, and I know you mentioned it uh, when you were talking to us about it, um, there was something like 6,000 kids running around the festival area with BC Lions gear and just taking in the festivities. And the one thing this league has always had an issue with is growing that younger market. Your middle-aged guys, like our generation is either going or they never will. You're not getting anybody new from our generation. It's that young generation, the next generation that has to continue to prop up the league and I think BC and the organizing committee and Amar Doman did a fantastic job of making sure some kids got to experience a Grey Cup festival because that's something they will remember and something that might get them to talk their parents into going to a game next year. That's all it really takes to start growing that next generation. Yeah, on the Thursday afternoon, I walked in. So there's two convention centers. The one had all the, the galas and the team parties and the other one had the the free stuff the fan zone all that kind of stuff um a lot more of the family oriented things so they had a they had a field a mini field inside they had a little spot where you can jump and and catch a ball and get your picture taken while you're diving for a catch that kind of stuff and so i went in there and it's packed but i look and i'm like there's a lot of kids here like what is going on turns out uh both thursday and friday there was school groups um classrooms that went so and and again like you said steve they were all wearing bc lions shirts orange shirts and it was just so fantastic to see and they all looked like they were having a good time and when that's that's how you do it that's how you get them in and even if half not even half those kids if a third of those kids so what two thousand kids go to their parents and say i had so much fun i want to i want to get into this I want to go to a game now and see what else there is. Well, they already have a shirt to wear to the game. So maybe mom and dad buy a hat at, at the game for them. And it just grows and grows and grows. So I know it's it's little steps. I know we're always looking for that quick fix to change things around. It's not going to happen. That's not how business generally works. It will take time, but the stones are there in place for for the cfl they've done such a good job and and bc just did a wonderful job of getting kids there and everybody loved it although trying to find people my age there was uh very difficult so luckily i ran into one of the kids that was there um was uh super fan mike of the turf district um podcast it was his kid that was that was there so i was able to link up with the the turf district guys so that was pretty cool I thought you were saying Super Fan Mike was one of the kids that was there. I'm like, yeah, that, that track too. He was yeah, kind of running around well. a little bit. He was having fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you, you know uh, I, did you run the forty? Uh, no, <laughs> I didn't even walk the forty. Um, but what was actually cool about uh, that uh, the little field that they had there is um, TSN was doing some panel stuff there on Friday, and they were doing their Sports Center hits and whatnot, and and it was Kate and and Bo, Hinok Mwamba, and Matt Dunnigan. And I was wearing my Birmingham Barracudas jersey. And right of right after they finished their their tape hit there, Dunnigan kind of like jumps down into the crowd and like pushes people aside and says, I gotta see that guy right there and shake his hand and came up to me and was like, Oh my god, who has a Birmingham Barracudas jersey? Of course, he played there in what 95. Um, but then right after that is 
people wanted to try and stop and talk to him and take a picture and everything. He grabbed a football and was just thrown with the kids for probably a good solid 20 minutes at least. And just, yeah, a couple of people tried to, you know, stopped him and everything, but like he was very quick about grabbing a football again and throwing it to the kids and not even talking to the adults that was there. So it was, it was a very good event for children. And it's something that I think all eight other CFL cities or provinces can, can look at duplicating and just get kids out there, get them in gear and let them have some fun. So it was a good great cup week, except for the player awards. Of course, Roland Milligan won defensive player of the year, um, which was no surprise to us. He had his wife, Samantha there as well and, and his newborn child. So that was pretty cool that he was able to get them, them up here. Um, Corey Mace lost coach of the year to Jason Moss. Eh, I'm not too upset about that. I think Mace should have beat him, but they usually just give it to the coach with the best record. So whatever. But the one that really bothered me and Greg, I'll let you take lead on this was Logan Furland not winning most outstanding offensive lineman. Instead, it was Ryan Hunter of the Argos, who not taking anything away from him. Very good season. Played two different positions. Was excellent at both. Just think Logan Ferlin deserved it more. Greg, go ahead. And you know it's serious because Greg actually did homework for this. I did. <laughs> so I actually went. Okay, so thanks to CFL's new um, relationship with uh, Pro Football Focus, they rate every position every week i went through every week to see who was the top rated offensive lineman every week argos graded out most of the year as the best offensive line as a unit which is fine they have, they have some really good guys there hunter so logan furland was scored three times best of his position uh, twice as guard once his tackle, never as a center. Once he moved to center, he was never graded because there's some really good centers in this league. And Ferland was just that there's a top stop gap, let's be honest. Hunter once. Just once. Even though the Argos were the highest rated line, he only scored once. Dijon Allen, he wasn't even the best offensive lineman on his team. Dijon Allen also was ranked the best uh, offensive lineman each uh, for the week three times. So if it would have been Allen versus Furland, I think I would have been okay, maybe. Like I, I don't get it. I Three Down Nation did their like in-house polling, their vote on it. They also picked Hunter, and they're like, because he played two positions. Furland played all five. Furland started at four of them and excelled at every single one of them. Like, you want to talk about outstanding? That's outstanding. I, I don't know what you need to do more than play all five positions and start fo uh, at four of them. I guess if he would have started at all five, maybe they would have gave it to him. And the fact that the vote wasn't even close. What was it? 41, well, 16. My mind. Like, are that's you what kidding me? Mad. That is what made me mad. Like, if it was, I even think the Mace Moss one, it was too far of a stretch, even though it was pretty close. I got a story on that. But, I mean, I got to tell you about that, the Mace vote. But the fact remains is this wasn't even close. So that tells you no one watches the games. It was just and, like, oh, it was so bad. Eastern bias. And, and to me, the most impressive part of Logan Furland's season wasn't just that he played four or five different positions. It was the fact that he played four or five different positions beside 12 different guys at points in the season and never once looked like he was out of place, never lo once looked like he didn't belong as a starting caliber player or all-star caliber player at the position he was playing. And honestly, people have, you said, you know, he was a stopgap at center. A lot of people think that that was his best position uh, of the year, that the team was at the best, at their best when Logan Furland was playing center. My, my favorite. To, Sorry, to shine at all of those positions 
consistently throughout the year and with the level of injuries that the riders had to face and still for the Eastern seaboard to basically ignore the fact that teams west of Toronto exist is it's a joke at this point. And the weirdest thing is, so the, the CFLPA put out their version of the All-Stars this year, or the All-CFL, whatever the hell they want to call them. I guess they know they call theirs the All-Stars. Neither guy made the offensive line either. Yeah, that was weird. It was just like, I I don't get the voting. I really don't get it. I've stopped trying to make sense of any of this at, at this point. Well, it's funny because uh, re- speaking of just weird voting, uh, I was going back f- uh, f- finalizing some CJFL stuff. The most, the two-time winning CFL, uh, CJFL most outstanding defensive player, Stephen Smith from the Regina Thunder, was not the best linebacker in the league. Somehow, he he I was don't get that. the he didn't yeah yeah wasn't and wasn't uh, first team all all Canadian either. And I'm like. How does that make sense? You just said he was the best player in the league for the second straight year. Like voting and all-star teams and awards, none of it makes sense because everyone tries to split their vote. That's what it is. It's just like, well, I can't vote for this guy because that, that, that's not fair. Or I want, well, I wanted to make this, this guy one, better. So I'll vote the other guy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, and that is why I believe these need to start being public. I yes. truly believe there needs to be transparency on this because it makes no sense. Because a lot, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of these guys' contracts have bonuses based on whether or not they are an all CFL or whether or not they get an award. So let's find out who's like why they're voting on this. Like there needs to be transparency on it. Well, look at Lucius Purifoy. He lost his mind after the All Star nominations because he okay, one literally second. cost on, on a scale him of one to Earl's thousand dollars <laughs> full Earl's. <laughs> He lost two thousand dollars to a guy with substantially lower stats across the board because Duqua was a Canadian and again played out east. The, these votes, no matter where they're coming from, are starting to get a little questionable at best. And I agree, transparency would make it at least a little more honest. So I said I had a story about the coach of the year voting. So it was pretty close between Mace and Moss. Uh, Moss won by, what was it, four votes? Four votes five yeah. votes, something like that. Um, the coaches vote on this as well. Corey Mace said that he voted for Jason Moss. And you're allowed to vote for yourself. If he would have voted for himself, now you're down to two votes. You get one other person to flip their vote, and all of a sudden... It's a it's a tie, so just thought it was pretty funny that he voted for the winner when he p- could have picked himself and would have been just that much closer to to possibly taking home the hardware, which really weird hardware this year. Weird trophies this year. These like... weird small trophies that look like miniature hammers or something. And that's what the Grey Cup MVP was. That's what the, yeah. I mean, Roland Milligan was walking around with his Defensive Player of the Year <laughs> award in Ryderville on, on Friday night. And, like, it's just a small little little trophy. Like, it was weird. Like, did there, is the league cheaping out on, on these right now? Because these have the nice, you know, big plaques yeah. and everything. But Somebody had to make a dollar ram or run right before the event because they forgot to get trophies. <laughs> Maybe. Honestly, that's kind of what it looked like. But imagine winning the MOP of the of the championship game and you get something that, you know, fits barely in the palm of your hands and, and looks like a child's toy. Yeah. Well, why does this say world's greatest grandpa on it? <laughs> <laughs> um, and we also do have to give a shout out to uh, Jorgen Hughes winning the Jake Adar Veterans Award, which is essentially for service to the community. Um guy that provides and we, thank him, and we thank him for his service because uh by history he's not gonna be here next year yeah so the riders have won this three straight years it was dan clark next season gone um who won it last year Linius. brain Linius. yeah gone um and now jorgen hughes 
So, <laughs> um, the good news but, is nobody remembers long snappers until they mess up, and he never messes up, so you'll never hear his name. So you won't have to worry about him getting cut. But just goes to show the Riders in the community doing uh, great work um, continues. And congratulations, Jorgen. Um, really quick here, just as we uh, kind of wrap up the opening kickoff here, uh, some Rider news as well. Um, 10 signings for the Riders. A lot of these guys were on the practice roster to end the year, so or bringing back guys that were on the expanded practice roster. So Riders are going to bring back defensive lineman Eric Black, defensive back Aaron Brooks, sorry, Antoine Brooks Jr., uh, punter Joe Couch, quarterback Michael Hires, which we knew about a couple weeks ago, linebacker Braxton Hill, defensive back Robert Javier, Javier. Again, we'll have to figure that out, find out what it is. Um, offensive lineman uh, Daniel Johnson, who they drafted last year, uh, or sorry, this year in the draft. Um, Braden Knoll, offensive lineman, another Canadian there. Zach Fillion, linebacker, Canadian as well. And then a new guy, um, defensive back Alfahim Walcott. So you said that uh, better than I thought because I'm looking. I'm like I have no idea how you say that. I I practiced a few times. I'm not gonna lie. When I saw that, I was like, I'm going to slow that down and and practice it, and hopefully I didn't uh, butcher it on him. But uh, some rider signings there, uh, guys. Hopefully coming to training camp next year. Well, that's the opening kickoff presented by Kathy Festion of Royal LePage Regina Realty. Jumping to our Churchill Brewing Company odds and end zones, and we're still going to kind of keep the Grey Cup theme going here. We will talk a little bit more riders in a minute here. Um, just want to give a huge shout out to CFL fans, CFL fans across the country, rider fans that helped out with this CFL fans fight cancer um, event at Grey Cup totaled seventy five thousand dollars which is unbelievable a couple years ago when we hosted the event we beat the record significantly and we got it to twenty four thousand. they tripled that in just two years so this whole thing has taken off the league's gotten behind it the teams have gotten behind it now it's a year round fundraiser which is fantastic and it's great to see, I mean, I saw people legit arguing about players and mad at each other at Grey Cup Week. But this is something that we can all agree on. It's a fantastic cause. So $75,000 raised across the country. Um, again, we had a couple of fundraisers as well this year. So thank you for, for donating to that and helping CFL fans fight cancer hit $75,000. Unbelievable. It's absurd to me to see how much that number has grown over the last few years and to see the event change from what was a one day event with a few, a few people have always had their events. Like I know, um, was it Wally always has his wristbands and, uh, and buttons and things like that. Like there's always been, you know, event, people selling things throughout, but to see it grow into an event that starts effectively as soon as last season's ends and run for a damn near calendar year is incredible. And to watch people come up with new ways to do it. We did the dunk tank in, uh, in 2022. You look now, you know, Chris did his uh, nine games or nine stadium uh, Guinness record tour and raised money along the way. And there's been other things all throughout it. Everybody's coming up with new and interesting ways to, to, to raise money. And it's, it's really fun to watch it grow the way it has. I'm excited to see what Winnipeg can do with uh, with the event next year. All right, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, Calgary Stampeders. <laughs> and Kadeem Carey, post-game after winning the Grey Cup, um, basically said Dave Dickinson is the reason for the decline in Calgary. And I would just like to thank the Calgary Stampeders and uh, mostly Jay McNeil for allowing Dave Dickinson to continue on his role in 2025 as GM head coach. So that makes me happy. But when you look at all the Everyone knows this former stamps, stamp. yeah, when you look at the former Stampeders on, on this Grey Cup winning Argos team, there's quite a few of them. And when they're starting to say that the head coach is the reason for the decline, that ain't good. 
Well, it's like, and like you said, it's not just the head coach. He's also the GM. Like Dickinson under Huffnagel, they had the secret sauce going. Huffnagel found the players and Dickinson had the talent to do what he wanted them to do. Once he started wearing two hats, he just hasn't been able to replace the players that they lose. Like it was whenever a guy went down in Calgary, his replacement was just as good, if not sometimes better than, than the guy he re, the guy that went down. Yeah. Um, that's not the case anymore. They, they they they're having trouble rolling out a quarterback. They're they're having trouble having receivers that can actually catch a ball. They just aren't as good as they used to be, and I think a big problem of it is Dickinson's one not a very not a good GM, and he's just overworked as a head coach. I I saw a couple of Stamps fans mention <laughs> that oh this was just sour grapes from a guy that was cut by the Stampeders. The dude just won the Grey Cup, just celebrating a championship trophy in the middle of the celebration of everything that's going on. There was no sour grapes there. That is a guy at the pinnacle of his career just telling it like it is. He, he has no reason to go after Calgary right there. He is celebrating a championship. We have all been saying it for the better part of a year now that, that Dickinson is part of the problem. And because of his multiple hats, he is part of the problem twice. It's just not working. I hope he gets a long-term extension in Calgary <laughs> as GM and head coach. Because it's about time they enjoy some suffering. They have had a long period of success. It's it's our turn now. But even if you look at last year, they they put um, Mueller in the role of calling the plays, and then immediately Dickinson takes back the takes back the role basically because he didn't like what Mueller was doing. Like he was micromanaging in, instead of taking some responsibilities off his plate, he had to micromanage it. Like, no wonder Mark wanted to leave. And look like, what Mueller just... did here. Yeah. Solid work Tr- as an offensive coordinator. Yeah. Trust your trust your guys. Mm-hmm. That's that's good management. Trust that what you have there is good and, and let them do their jobs. Um and hopefully that sticks with uh with both Dickinsons. Maybe Dave can be the GM and Craig can be the head coach for a while. That can be the next ten year tandem. Oh my lord! I, uh, <laughs> if any team makes Craig Dickinson their head coach, they deserve what they get. A bowling tournament. Now the interesting thing uh, with the off season now upon us is all the movement that's going to happen with management, and we're going to see that with BC and Edmonton. BC is going to move on from Rick Campbell. His contract is up as head coach. Sounds like he's uh, might be heading east. Um, one province over to a place that just hired their new GM, the Edmonton Elks, just hired Ed Hervey. So what's old is new again in Edmonton. Another They are mainlining nostalgia. Like That is all they're doing right now. This is a team that is literally trying to do anything they can to focus on the EE. Anything that had the Eskimos name back in the day, whether it was 40 years ago, whether it was 10 years ago, they're bringing them back. This is what this team is doing. They might not do the name change, but they're going to do everything they can to get as close to possible without doing so. So I don't know. I got nothing on who they hire as GM. I don't really care. It doesn't really affect me, but it's just sad that they're, going back to the well, going back to the well, going back to the well when they just can't move on. Well, when we knew this was coming, when Larry Thompson was hired, because he he said, or bought, sorry, bought the team, because his first thing was he was going to bring back the Eskimo way. Who's his first hire? Craig Moore, former uh, Edmonton Eskimo. Who's his first hire? Ed Hervey. Who, and it's, they're not even trying to hide their plans. They they were quite open about what they intended to do uh, when he bought the team at that very first, very exciting, well-spoken uh, press conference from uh, from Larry. Oh, he's that a, he's a firecracker. They, they need yeah. they need to put they need to put him in front of a mic any chance they get. Uh, yeah, they they need him in front of a mic like the Calgary Stampeders need Dave Dickinson's long term long term extension. 
just I, I don't understand it. There's there's nothing wrong with Ed Hervey as a GM. I don't think it's necessarily a bad choice, but it's a predictable one. We we could have basically called this succession from day one. And of course, they're going after Cam- they're they're looking at Campbell because of course Hugh Campbell. They they, they like I said, they are just mainlining nostalgia constantly. I, I cracked a joke. Or like, are they going to see if Warren Moon can come out and play? Because he was the best quarterback they ever had. Like, tr- trying to get Nor- Normie Kwong's ghost to come out and play running back. Like, I don't understand. Yeah, what's Brian Kelly up to? <laughs> like, this is just ridiculous. Like, I understand they are craving the glory days. And they, they, they truly believe in their heart of hearts that the name change change the direction of this franchise and if they were still the eskimos they'd have another five st- uh, great cups and blah 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 like yes herbie is a decent enough gm yes campbell is a decent enough coach and they're probably going to be better because of it but the fact remains is g roy was doing an okay job with what w- with the hand he was dealt one thing that uh, Chris Jones is very good at is leaving a mess behind him that other people have to clean up. So he was working his way through it, but it's just, I don't know. Like I, we, we are two years away from it. Then we call the Eskimos again. I can just feel it in my bones. Seems to be trending that way. Okay. Now back to the rider talk um, throughout on X, we put a poll up. We're going to start taking a look at the Riders positional groups in the off season here, who they have, where they need to upgrade from, where they don't need to upgrade from. And so put I, what I put quarterbacks, offensive line, defensive line, and defensive backs, I think is what I put up for this one. And to no surprise here in Saskatchewan, people want to talk about the quarterbacks. No, so, even though we did this last week to an extent, We'll do this for a little bit this week as well. We got a little bit of time to do that. So as of right now, who they're bringing back? Well, they have Michael Hires, who we just mentioned that they signed. He was here for a few weeks as the practice rosters expanded. We don't really know anything about him. So next season, we'll see if he can uh, crack the practice roster, basically, is, is what we're hoping out of it, something like this. Well, let's go to Jack Cohn. He's the next guy under contract. Now, Cohn was 10 of 21, had 100 yards, a touchdown. He had three rushes for 14 yards in his only action of the season. That was the final game against Calgary. He was 6 of 8 for 40 in um, preseason against Winnipeg and 1 of 3 for 3 yards against Edmonton in the second preseason game. So very small sample size, but going back to that Calgary game where we saw him the most, Showed some flashes, I guess. Um, Those are Zach Kolaris numbers. <laughs> Who does he think he is, right? He could be starting in Grey Cups with those numbers. Um, but he did yeah, have he that threw a t- He threw a touchdown pass, though. No. Touche, yeah. Um, did show some flash in, in that game. And, of course, I was with a B team around him. Yeah. A lot of C team around him, too. Um, Obviously, not going to be the starter next year. Guy you want to try and develop. Can he get to the next level next year? This is a guy that I would expect should be leading for the third quarterback who could possibly push for the backup quarterback position next year. Maybe not right off the bat, but throughout the year, that's where I'd like to see him progress. So those are the two guys for sure that are under contract for next year. What did you guys think of Jack Cohn anyway uh, when we did see a little bit out of him in, against Calgary? Was that enough to bring him back for next year? Uh, he, he's shown he's got the talent, obviously. I think, obviously, his first year in the CFL game, bigger field. Um, one last down. You can tell a few, a few of the plays that he made where he should have been throwing for the sticks. He was ex- expecting he was going to have another down to throw. Um so he, he needs to learn the game and refine a bit, but, and 
like I said, based on that uh, one feature that uh, Vanstone put out, the team is high on him. Even Trevor Harris is very high on him. They they were talking about him as the next heir apparent, completely bypassing Patterson. So um, obviously he's got some big supporters in this uh, in the front office. So hopefully he can uh, back it up. I think that part alone tells you what their plans are for him. He did enough to me to get a call back and to get a legitimate shot at that three spot. Uh, beyond that, he's going to need a lot more seasoning. He's very fresh, very green. Uh, but there's definitely potential there. He showed it in, in bits and pieces in that Calgary game, more in the preseason than anything. But you can't really hold that game against them. The uh, the Calgary game, nobody showed up. His his best receiving threat was Colton Hunchak. So, no. <laughs> um, so that brings us to Shea Patterson. Greg, you just mentioned um patterson's going to be a free agent 1655 yards passing in his in his six starts uh seven games basically um through six touchdowns five interceptions having a positive touchdown to interception ratio to me is a good thing obviously like that number to be a little bit higher in the touchdowns less than the interceptions obviously but not terrible um Actually, that's better than Zach Caleros for most of the season, for being completely honest. Also had seven uh, touchdowns um, carrying the ball on the ground. Most quarterback sneaks there. Two, three, and one record in his six games that he started. Not really going to knock that last Calgary loss on him, but also that game as well. What did you, before we talk about should they bring him back, what did you guys think of Shea Patterson this year? This is this was his third season in the league, second with the Riders, first one to really get a chance on the field to show what he has with that injury to Trevor Harris. I, I said it last week. I don't want to see Shea Patterson anywhere near this roster next year. Um, this was his chance to really break away as the clear number two, and I don't think he did it. He looked okay at times. He gives you a decent running threat, except on third and short. He gives you no running threat at all other than sideways. And if for no other reason than his inability to run a short yardage package, I don't want to see him here. I've seen enough. I'd rather them look at a legitimate backup. We saw with Toronto what happens if you have a legitimate backup behind your starter. On the flip side, we saw in Winnipeg what happens if you don't. You know, Shea Patterson is not that guy to me. I, I think they could do better. And I think they will do better in the offseason. That being said, I think Corey Mace would have, God forbid, Trevor Harris was missing a finger. I'm pretty sure Trevor, they, they, they wouldn't have rolled Trevor Harris back out there <laughs> and they would have went with Shea Patterson. Um, although they could have went to Jake Dalagala. I like he, he was apparently there. I, I completely forgot he signed in Winnipeg. But, anyways, uh, back to Patterson. Um, yeah, you're right. I don't want him here next year. Um, unless he's going to... God forbid, unless they think he can actually compete for starter, there's no reason to bring him back. Because he can't run the short yardage, and I, I just... We've seen enough of him. I they, they need to find someone to actually be that number two. Hell, they might need to find someone to be that number one if they if they can't get that sorted out. So, uh, And Patterson ain't that guy. I, I think, and, and I think it, you bring someone else in. I think in this offseason where you look at the array of quarterbacks that are going to be available in the offseason, there are a lot of free agent quarterbacks, starters and legitimate backup possibilities. To If they roll back with Trevor Harris, Shea Patterson, and Jack Cohn as their top three, I think they've failed this, this team as a, as a whole. I think with Patterson, I felt good about him at the start after Trevor, Trevor Harris got hurt because he had that win against um, Toronto. Then he had a win against uh, Winnipeg as well, too. The other games, not so good. The games were close, though, so it's not like he was awful by any means. But it just never felt like he took kept taking that next step. He plateaued and then just kind of streamlined and sank a little bit. That last game against Calgary frustrated me just for that reason is 
I know you're again with the B and the C team around you and just everything was deflated in that game after that stupid gust of wind. I, I, I'm with you guys. I don't think he needs to be brought back. They can do better. They should do better than that. If they do bring him back, I can't see him being any more than... I, I can't even say a backup right now, number two. But at that point, he's... That, that short yardage, Steve, you said it perfectly on that. Like He just struggled so much with that short yardage that I don't see a role for him on this team going forward. Like so, We forget last year they went out and got Pipkin because Patterson couldn't do the short yardage. And some reason they thought this year Patterson would get it together, and he just didn't. He got progressively worse. Yes. Yeah. So we're not seeing him go up. We're seeing him regress and once somebody regresses especially that quarterback see ya you know what he turned out to be and it was funny because this is kind of uh full circle for for shea patterson he ended up becoming mason fine he was okay <laughs> he, said he, he beat mason fine out for that number two job in in training camp which we were all happy about mm-hmm. but he was Mason fine. He was fine. Wasn't good. Wasn't terrible. But time to move on. He, you could put him in there and trust him to not actively lose a game. But he wasn't going to win it either. Yep. Enough to keep it close, but still need some help to uh to get that win, right? So Need to need to find somebody better. Whether it's a, a veteran backup, whether it's going to be a, a younger one as well, to somebody with a little bit of experience, there's going to be plenty of options available, and I'm sure one of those will be making their way to Ryderville. Which brings us to our final name, of course, QB one Trevor Harris was 20 touchdowns, nine interceptions, couple touchdowns rushing as well. He actually ran the short yardage better than Shea Patterson did. Um, what was most important about Trevor Harris while he was sixth in passing, fourth in touchdowns, number one quarterback efficiency in the league, he had the seven and four record. And a few of those losses were right when he first came back from injury and can't really place those losses on him. There was the game in Montreal, the game in Toronto, there was a couple, uh, and then Badger Bowl and, and Labor Day. So yes, he could have done better in those games, but it's not like they lost the games because of him. So, um, yeah, that game in Toronto, those interceptions uh, from the end zone. <laughs> yeah, there, there there was more. That that there that was score more. Did, that that score did flatter the Riders. Honestly, oh they, yeah, they, that the defense, defense balled defense. out on that. That defense balled out on that one. Like, All those goal they, line they, stands. They, that short yards defense. That was a fun game to be at until the end. <laughs> it was actually. Um, but the seven and four record that speaks volumes. The guy was winning games for us, and he was the best bet for the Riders. And where I see the Riders are right now, going into twenty twenty five, they're going to be in win now mode. Mm-hmm. They're they're close. They can see what it takes, and I think they're going to learn that in the off season and another year with Corey Mace. Another year with uh, Mark Mueller growing as an f- offensive coordinator. I think they want to keep that um, collective group together and just that cohesion. I don't think they want to have another offensive coordinator and quarterback um, pairing, I guess, to uh, to start next year. So that would be three straight years where we'd have a change there. Don't want to see that. That's just too much keep the continuity going. Um, so I do believe that they will bring back Trevor Harris as QB one. I don't even think they go after another guy until you get whatever backup in free agency. I think Harris is QB one gives them their best chance to win now, which is what the riders are going for. And I, I just don't see a way where it's anyone other than Trevor Harris as QB one. And I'm okay with that. With the team ready to win now, you kind of need the vet to uh, to take you there as quarterback. Guess that means Harris is the guy. 
one of two things it's, is going to happen. Um, they're either going to sign Harris before Christmas, or they're going to do something wild and like trade for Vernon Adams rights. That's that's the only two things I can see happening. I I don't see them actively pursuing another quarterback unless it's Trevor Harris. You know, not to give Greg any credit, but he, when he wrote about this, he the words "if not Trevor, then who?" It's accurate. There there is nobody else right now that can lead this team going forwards and give them the best chance of success. This isn't the year you take a shot on a guy like Davis Alexander. Even a guy like Vernon Adams, I'm not sure I trust him with a Mark Mueller style offense. This is not a home run hitting offense. This is a dink and dunk down the field precision style offense. And there is not a better quarterback in the CFL at short yardage accuracy than a Trevor Harris. I think we're at least a year, if not more, away from a potential succession plan. I think we roll back with Trevor Harris, and I am not just okay with that, I'm hoping for that. Which is funny, because I know a lot of fans are hoping that we move on from Trevor Harris and go younger, which, generally speaking, is not always a bad thing to do. If you can save some money and go younger, try and find the franchise guy, but and I and I get that, but the, as close as this team is, you and I hate the overemphasis on quarterback usually, but the quarterback is one of your major positions. You've got a strong offensive line already. R- running game needs to be figured out. You've got some great receivers. Like you do not want to change that court that position right now when next year we were half a game out of first place we were a wind gust away from first place which i argue kept us from the great cup because there's no way winnipeg was coming here and winning winnipeg is a way different team at home than they are anywhere else Mm -hmm. um i actually have notes on that too i meant to discuss that earlier about winnipeg (laughs) but uh, i'll go quickly they're seven and two at home four and five on the road and they should have lost here. They should have lost in Montreal. They they should have been a two and seven team on the road. So, but the fact remains is you don't want to change your quarterback when you're in a win now mode, because that, you do that and then it's all it's all chaos. And I've said before, I think in pro football, not just the CFL, this includes the NFL. You have your top tier guys. You have a couple of elite ones. You have a group of really good ones and then there's everybody else and somewhere down there below them is Jake Mayer. <laughs> the average quarterbacks now and and you see this in in the NFL, they're so similar to each other that there's so many of them that maybe it's because the position got so good, I guess, is that what we see as elite isn't a like just that just doesn't happen anymore. There's no guys that really stand out above the rest. NFL, you have Josh Allen, you have Lamar Jackson. Um, maybe you can throw uh, Joe Burrow, right? Like there, there's a couple of them that you can say are the top talents. In the CFL, there really isn't one. Bo Levi Mitchell for the stats this year, I guess, was the guy, but didn't make the playoffs and I know quarterback wins isn't a real stat and and it's a team game, but when there's so few excellent quarterbacks out there and you have a very, very good one, I just don't see how you can move on. If quarterback wins are not a uh, quarterback, sorry, if wins are not a quarterback stat, how the hell did Bo Levi Mitchell not win MOP? Just saying. Uh, the, the, like I said, rankings I go quarterback from the East that wins <laughs> quarterback from the West that wins Canadian athlete quarterback from the East that loses. I have the entire uh, bias rankings out there, Steve. And then it's defensive players, punters, Jake no Mayer. defensive players way back. Kick, kick, kickers are at the bottom. There's no way, but yeah, yeah. Canadian kickers, defensive players in there somewhere too. Kickers, the Jake Mayer of uh, winning. <laughs> but when it all comes down to it when you have a good quarterback you don't want to move on from it you 
Like, unless you're getting something better, Greg, you wrote about it. I don't know who's better that's available. Maybe Bo Levi Mitchell. But he's not available. But, he's still under contract. Right? Not, like he's not playing under that contract. Ask him. No, yeah. He also well, that's, said he's, all, that's, all, all these guys saying they're not playing under their contract this year is wild. It's, it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. So. But if Hamilton moves go. on, who are they going to? Like, that's the other thing is, like, Bo's yeah. kind of got, got him where he wants him. Well, and right now, quarterbacks and this is everywhere have all the leverage. Are you going to find better than me? Probably not. So pay me. The only quarterback without without any uh, leverage somehow is Vernon Adams. The guy on an MOP level run is the is the one without leverage. At least he's got what three hundred K guaranteed to him next year, fifty <laughs> percent well, of his salary. Yeah. So technically yeah, speaking, the only quarterback. Has a lot of tissues to cry into. Right now, the quarterback that can write his own check right now is Davis. I'd argue is Davis Alexander, and that's if Montreal wants to move him. Like he, technically speaking, they're both. Both him and Cody are still under contract, actually, I believe. Cody's under contract uh, for Davis one more is year. Done. Davis is a free agent. Yes. So I'd argue he's might be the only one that can write his own check right now. But, again, smaller sample size. Do you yes. want to get caught with, with that, right? Like, unless you Someone know. Will. Oh, absolutely. Drew Brown, right? Small sample size in Winnipeg. But did pretty well in, in Ottawa. He seems like he's going to be a pretty good CFL starter. But that doesn't happen all the time. So many of these guys just flame out after a couple good games. And then not saying that's going to happen with Davis, Davis Alexander, but that's the trend we see. So it's hard to say that you should go all in on the guy when you haven't seen much. See Arbuckle Nick. And and don't get me wrong, he's great cup MVP this year, but he, there was a big hype coming out of him, went to Ottawa, nothing happened, went to Edmonton, nothing happened, went to Toronto, went somewhere else, somewhere else after that, I believe. Back to Edmonton? I don't know. Anyway, back to Toronto, I, well, almost Edmonton. retired, and then became the MOP. Like, It's a weird game. So there you go, quarterbacks. I'm sure uh, – I, I really think we'll see – a signing announcement sometime in December of Trevor Harris for possibly two years. I can, I can really see it being two years. I don't see it being a one year. I, I don't see them putting him in a lame duck for next year. No, not with the, uh, not with the contracts that they have with the coaching staff in place. I think they lock themselves to Trevor Harris for the remainder of their contracts. So it'll be interesting. It's going to be a good, uh, good off season. And again, quarterback, no matter what, even after Harris, Resigns, which we we all agree is going to happen. You know, people are going to lose their minds over it and say, "Why didn't we do this? Why didn't we do that?" And that's what we love about Ryder fans. We're always, it's it, we're always talking quarterbacks, and that's always fun. So we'll we'll see what happens. I guess um, next week we'll uh, we'll throw it back out to the listeners again to see what you guys want to which positional group we should take a look at. Maybe we'll focus on a, on a defensive one. We'll jump back and forth offense, defense. So maybe we'll, we'll throw the defensive ones up there. See who uh, you guys want to hear us talk about, but I think that's going to do it. Unless you guys have anything else this week. Well, let's talk about spend our, another uh, minute the, laughing about the bombers. Well, yeah, that's who, and bombers. our, our pick them, our pick them. I, I fair homed it. You did. You did. Lost I, I would just like game. to say, for the greater good, I pick Winnipeg. You are welcome. It wasn't, it wasn't going to make a difference anyway, Steve. You yeah. were way not for my record. Anyway. Not for my record, but I had to make that pick. You know how dirty it was for me to pick the Bombers in a Grey Cup championship game? But I did it for you, Ryder Nation. I did that for you. For for eight fan bases, really. Yeah. Oh, maybe not maybe not Hamilton. They no, yeah, no, Hamilton. Yeah. Man. Their whole existence is based off Toronto sucking. So, um, yeah. All right. But even they have to hate Winnipeg a little bit with after the two Grey Cup losses. You'd think, you'd think the hate is there. It's just who, to, who hasn't Hamilton Toronto. lost to in a Grey Cup, though? <laughs> Touche. 
Touche. Well, we'll leave it there and we'll uh, pick up the conversation again next week, talking more riders, hopefully some uh, re-signings and we'll see what happens over the next week. Pivot's podcast brought to you by our great friends at Dairy Queen on Elphinstone Street and Sass Drive in Regina. Special thanks, of course, to Kathy Festion of Royal LePage Regina Realty and Churchill Brewing Company for their support, making this show possible. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching on YouTube, Sastel Max TV on demand. We appreciate it. This is Ghost Behind Your Mind by Tyler Gilbert. <laughs>